Thanks again to First Mark and thanks to Blue Core. It's great to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about public key crypto. Um, and when I when I was thinking about this talk, I thought about crazy and inaccurate generalizations I can make, and I basically decided to say that there are basically two different types of internet applications. So this is kind of what I was thinking. Um, so so here's the first type of thing you could build on the internet. One of two possibilities. Uh, the first is you could have something like Alice, Bob, Chelsea, and Doug, and they all like enter all their like secret or important data and like send it to some server. And that server kind of like digests it and spits it back out in, in, in very guarded ways. So something like recommendation engines, or you know, I, I come from OkCupid, so something like like a dating site. Like this is a very common internet usage, right? You're trusting the server just to to give the data, the secret data, out to the right people. Like this is like a lot of things fit the bill, like you know Uber or like eBay or whatever. So that's like the first type of internet application. So the second is like a lot simpler. It's like the internet is just basically moving data from one person to the next. So you can imagine like Alice sending some stuff to Bob. And maybe Bob isn't online, so it like has to get buffered on a hard drive somewhere. Or maybe Bob has like multiple devices, and so it has to like duplicate the data a bunch of times. So this is like the second type of internet application. And I think what's really crazy is we're still building these two things the same way. And um, uh, this probably isn't the right thing to do in this day and age. So um, this is code driven. This is my one piece of code. It's a particularly hairy piece of JavaScript to figure out what year it is. So if the year is greater than 1976, you should not be treating these two applications the same way. They're actually, they should be treated differently. And um, well, what happened in 1976? There, were, there was this really interesting paper written by two guys who said, there's this new type of cryptography that allows for data to be transmitted across the internet without Alice and Bob having met ahead of time to exchange keys. So it's called public key crypto. It's like incredibly revolutionary. It's been around for 40 years. And um, oh, and by the way, like the intelligence agencies knew about it like you know decades before or whatever. But anyway, um, that's a public key crypto, and it kind of works this way. So if Alice wants to send a message to Bob. The first thing she does is she gets Bob's public key, and uh, when she has Bob's public key, she takes her data and she encrypts it, and she puts it into this safe and sends the encrypted data across the internet to Bob, and then he's able to decrypt it and recover the original message. So this is the way um, systems should be built. And what's good about it is like Bob has some like secret piece of information that only he knows that allows him to decrypt the data that Alice sent him. That's uh, what makes the system so uh, powerful. And, and by the way, if any bad stuff is going on in, the, in, in between, if like, you know, the server got broken into, or if like someone's snooping on your ISP or whatever, whatever kind of like bad stuff can happen in between, it doesn't really matter, right? Because all they got was like this encrypted data, and you know, Alice and Bob don't have to lose their their secrets. So that's the promise of the public key. So the big question is, why is nobody using public key? You know, why is it still like this? totally unadopted, useless technology as far as most people are concerned. Um, and it's something I kind of think a lot about. I mean, I've been working with this new project called Keybase for about a year now, and it's like, we think about this every day. Like, what does it take to get people to build systems the right way? Um, and we kind of came to the conclusion that in order for public key to be very useful, you have to solve, and not just our solution, but any solution who's going to get there, you have to solve three different problems at once. You have to make it easy to get people's public keys. You have to make it easy for people like Bob to manage their secret keys. And finally, you have to do all of this in a simple, polished app that doesn't really feel like it's some kind of crypto stuff that no one really understands. And so I think, you know, if ever anyone is going to crack public key crypto, they got to do three things all at once. Um, and I'll kind of show you why, um, why it's been a problem historically. I think that's like, you know, more or less what I want to say today. Um, and this is like going to be the whipping boy, right? Does anyone use GPG here? All right, we got like a couple people. Um, and it's like really forward looking software. It's been around for 20 years, hasn't really been broken. Um, it does a lot of things right, but it also has a lot of problems, right? And so GPG is the software that people use today if they want to try to use public key crypto to prevent their transmissions from being snooped upon. So um, 
here's the first problem why PGP is so hard to use, and it's the identity problem. So you have Bob, you need to get his public key if you want to send an email to Bob and not to someone pretending to be Bob. But how do you know you get Bob's public key and not to someone else who's trying to be an ad, who's trying to maliciously um, impersonate him? Well, um, uh, PTP has this idea of a key party, um, and not that you know it's not. There's Bob's key sitting in the in the bowl right there. Um, so uh, anyway, that's like from the ice storm. So not that kind of key party, but this type of key party. And so what a key party? What happens in a key party is you get together with 20 people who you've never really met before, and you all kind of look at each other's driver's license, look, driver's licenses, look at each other's public keys, look at each other's faces, and like combine and say, aha, it's the right person. Then you go home and you sign a bunch of statements saying that this is the same guy who had that driver's license, who had that public key. And if everyone does that all throughout the world, then anyone else is going to be kind of reachable by this graph of public key relationships, which is kind of a cool idea. This is like early 90s crypto. It was like this underground like hacker community that did this. Um, so how does it work? And this is an example I love to think of. So you guys know Gavin Andreessen? He's like super famous. He's like the lead developer on, uh, on Bitcoin, right? So what happens if you try to look up his public key? Well, this is what this is what you get. Um, one of these is the right Gavin Andreessen. Um, it's almost certainly not the first one because the first one is a 1024-bit RSA key, which is like hopelessly broken. So don't click the first link. This isn't Google, right? Um, oh, and by the way, this is over HTTPS, so like all problems solved, right? No, that, that's not actually. Um, uh, so anyway, this is public key today. You've got to figure out who is the right Gavin Andreessen. And like, you will never do it. So obviously, the system is not working. OK, so that was kind of like Alice's problem, when she tried to send a message to Bob. She had to find the right Bob, the right secret, uh, public key. So Bob has a corresponding problem, which is that he can't really, get, he can't really control his secret key very well. So this is what a PGP secret key looks like. Um, and if you run PGP, your challenge is to move this thing to all of your devices. right? So like if you have a phone, you have to move this thing onto your phone somehow. And by the way, like you can't use iCloud, because like that would defeat the whole purpose. Right, so like, how are you going to get this data onto your phone? It's like it's a real problem, um, and you know there are also like associated pitfalls. Like a lot of people say, oh, I realize PGP is useful, but I used to use it like five years ago, and I lost the machine that had my secret key on it, and I'm like now I can't recover my key. It's like out there in the world, and it's like not really accessible to me. So. A lot of people say that, and a lot of people say, like, even if I did put my key on all of my devices, like on my phone and my watch, what happens when I lose my phone? Does that mean like I have to like cancel my identity and start all over again? So even that feels like a horrendous problem that like so far there's not really you know a good solution to. Um, and so you can imagine a future, this bright future, where you know, Bob doesn't just have one secret key, he has like 10 secret keys, like one for each of his devices. And that way, when Alice encrypts for Bob, you know, she actually encrypts like 10 times, one for each of Bob's devices. And if Bob wants to throw away a device, that's fine. He, he can keep the other nine devices without having to reset. So like, that's also something you really want from your, from your app if you're going to build something with public key. Um, and finally, there's this idea that you want like some sort of simple polished app, right? Like the bar has gone up nowadays. Like you can't launch something that's just like you need to use the command line to, to get it working, right? No one's going to really accept that. And the other mistake I think people have made over the years is they want to they want to secure email. Right? And email is a very hard thing to secure because um, it's fulfilling so many different purposes at once, right? I use my email for like a messenger and a calendaring system and like I send files back and forth with it, and it's like a file transfer protocol, and it's a to-do system, and it's like an authentication mechanism. And like, if you're going to make this product better, you have to make all these experiences better at the same time, which is like a really tall order. So that's why like no one's ever able to fix email because it's like doing all sorts of different things at once. Like the best you could do is like chip away at it and kind of pick a, a particular part. Um, 
And oh, and, and by the way, the other problem with GPG is like this is the this is just a third of the man page for it. So if you really want to use it correctly and like use it with regards to your email, like you kind of have to understand all this stuff. And you know this is kind of the way crypto has gone up till now. And because we're going after complicated applications like email, and because we're trying to make everyone happy, you know a lot of people kind of think they gotta make an application that looks a lot like this. Um, so if ever anything in crypto is going to catch on, it's like it has to be more convenient than the status quo. It can't just be like slightly better. It has to be, it has to be actually better, and it has to have like a way of virally recruiting users. And so like, you know, this is also a challenge for making a crypto app like actually useful. So it's like a lot of things to get right all at once. Um, so I think I've made, hopefully made the point that like, to get crypto useful, you have to solve a lot of hard problems. Um, and there's one thing that like, comes up a lot, which I don't think is instrumental to, to making crypto available to people, and that is, um, uh, that is this problem. Okay, so here's like, all the people in the world, and like, th those are the programmers up there. All right, so here are the programmers, and like, here are the people who really care about security, right? And it's kind of like, there's like a little bit, like, they're mainly programmers, but some people outside of it. Um, but if you look like even closer, um, there's like this weird overlap where people like really care about security and they, a lot of people really care about decentralization. And it's like the same group of people. So uh, these are both extremely laudable goals and like the world should be decentralized and secure, but just because like the same people care about them does not mean like any solution has to both be decentralized and uses good crypto. So I think that's like, if you're trying to figure out what to do and what not to do, it could be you don't have to care about decentralization, uh, even though it's like a loud chorus of people that says, you must make your system decentralized for anyone to use it. So anyway. Um, I, this is like, I'm working on a project called Keybase and we're kind of trying to solve this problem. Um, and um, we're going after these three problems and ignoring the fourth. But uh, I feel like it doesn't matter if you use, if you think about like our solution or any other solution, I think it has to solve these problems for crypto to be useful to a large audience. Um, and um, if anybody wants to talk about it after, I'm like more than happy to go over like our different aspects to the solution. But um, in conclusion, I think it's it's really important. We should be building systems with end-to-end -end crypto. I think it's like useful for users. It's useful for, I mean, even the service providers in between. Like they don't want to have to deal with this data that can't be stolen from them. And if it's stolen from them, it's a huge like disclosure. So um, it, it seems like the right way to build systems. But to do so, we're going to have to build a system that solves these three hard problems at once. So um, that is all I had to say. And if you care to use our Keybase product, we have something live, and we have an invite code for people at this um, at this talk. It's, it's code dash driven. And um, uh, should I ask for questions later or, or now? Okay, great. So that's it. Yes. How is this related to uh, sort of other sets of questions, such as passwords, hashtags, or hash labels? Uh, so this is so everything you have to remember to get into all your systems. So, so that's so the password system is like this artifact of a world that predates anyone using public key crypto. So, if you actually had a way to to just sign things with your device rather than just having to authenticate with a password, you would, you would develop a whole, totally different system, right? So imagine some future world where everyone on their iWatch has like their, their private key and to sign into a website, you just kind of hold your watch up to it and it just says whoever's holding that watch can authenticate themselves as this user. I think, the, I think the right way to do that is to sign a statement saying that this is Max, I'm signing into Facebook and here's my signature, which is a really much better system than password because passwords are susceptible to replay attacks, right? As long as you, you're Facebook and someone types you a password, then Facebook can turn around and give that password to someone else and pretend to be you to that different service. So that's why you have to come with passwords for all these different services, which is why they're so hard to remember. Now, if you just had a secret key that would sign a statement saying, I am who I am, please let me in, then that would actually solve the problem. So that's kind of like a long-term solution if everyone had a secret key and was able to use public key crypto effectively. In the meantime, 
and I think it's super important that if ever you build new applications, it's just like you don't want to rely on passwords at all. I mean, I, I hate typing passwords on a phone, so you know that's like a cha another challenge for secure app developers. Like a lot of solutions are like, well, you have to type this 40 byte password to get access to the to the server, and that's obviously does not work at all on a on a, on a mobile phone. So um, yeah, that's that's my thought on passwords. I don't know if I answered the question or not. Well, I was thinking also that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, that hash keys, for instance, right. I remember I archived those for all the development I did. A hash key. So, what do you mean by hash keys? Yeah, in terms of being able to set up listing the Google Google Play Store, for instance. Okay, Google, Google Play Store. Okay, I, I, I'm not entirely familiar with that protocol, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could tell me offline. So, okay, thanks. So, I think in, in another supplement to password is like two-factor. Right? So, yeah. everything that our company do, but pretty much everything is locked down with two-factor. So, what, sure. what's your, your your pitch for? Don't use two-factor, but use uh, crypto. Well, so, so two-factor is basically giving you two things at once. I think it's protecting you from replay attacks, right? So if someone has your password and has your the last code you've typed into your to your app, that won't allow them to log in the next time because that that thing changed, right? The the second factor changed. So that's number one that that you get from two factor. The other thing you get is the, this property that for someone to pretend to be you, they need to know the password and have the device. So as long as you have a solution that combines those two features, resilience to replay attacks, and that you need both the the factor, the, the device, and the password, that's basically good enough. So like an example would be like your iPhone is basically gives you two factor um, now like. One factor is like your password, which is your fingerprint, and the other factor is the phone itself, which, which has a secret key on it. And so that's basically, in an ideal world, what you would use to authenticate yourself to, web, to websites, right? So using the, your thumbprint, you unlock your secret key. Using your secret key, you sign a statement saying, please log me into this website. And then that's basically just as good as two-factor. And also, two-factor involves a lot of server trust, too, which you may or may not be happy with, I mean, depending, depending on your scenario. All right.